Welcome to Compass, you're live on gbc.com. Hello, Mr. Professor Lomonosov. Welcome to our interview today. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, and very pleased to be talking to you. That's such an honor to host you in my today's discussion about this mysterious tobacco mosaic virus. Ladies and gentlemen, let me please, first of all, introduce uh, Professor Lomonosov. Mr. George Lomonosov um, from the very famous John Inner Center from Norwich, UK. You obtained both your BA and PhD from the University of Cambridge and joined the John Innes, is it Innes or Ines? Uh, Innes. 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 Yes, Innes Center in Norwich already 1980. I mean, mm -hmm. your research has focused on the molecular biology of the RNA plant viruses and their use in bio and nanotechnology. In 2012, uh, you were then named uh, the BBSRC Innovator of the Year. We'll come back uh, uh, to this abbreviation for your work on plant-made pharmaceuticals. And in 2015, you delivered the Microbiology Society Colorworth Prize Lecture. The transient expression system you developed so-called CPMV HD is used worldwide and is currently deployed by leaf expression system Norwich to scale up production of plant-made products. Mm -hmm. Today, as I said before, we will talk about the tobacco mosaic virus. Thanks for having us accepted my invitation. Okay, you're most welcome. Please explain about this about the fascination uh, among scientists for the first ever discovered virus, the tobacco mosaic virus. Yes, I mean, it goes back, um, well, well over 100 years, which I suppose is comparatively recent. Um, so at the time in the 19th century, there was a lot of work on diseases, particularly bacterial diseases. And I'm sure people have heard of Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, and all these people looking at various diseases, including tuberculosis, very prevalent at the time. But there was a Russian scientist working in St. Petersburg called Dmitry Ivanovsky, who noticed there was this <clears throat> condition of tobacco grown in Crimea, um, which is a tobacco growing area in the south. And it caused the leaves to develop a sort of mosaic pattern rather like, you know, ancient mosaics you would see in, you know, temples from, you know, ancient Greece or ancient Rome. And he was curious about this. It seemed to be a disease which you could pass. And he thought it must be a bacterial disease of plants. So he made an extract of these um, uh, leaves, which are infected, and showed that the juice could actually be used to infect other plants. So it was infectious. It wasn't just some effect of the environment on the plant. You could transmit it, so fine. And then he, he did a technique which was very common in those days and is still used to a certain extent today. He passed the, um, the extract through a, a filter, a very fine poured filter, um, which is, the pores are so small that bacteria can't pass through. And this is a way at the time, and it's, as I say, still used to sterilize a solution because the bacteria held back the stuff you get through the filter would no longer be infectious. So you can sterilize solutions that way. But he found that his infectious agent actually passed through these filters. And so it was obviously much smaller than a bacterium. But he, you know, a little bit uh, tentative about this. Um, and he thought that, well, that's one explanation. The other one could be my filter isn't working. There's something wrong with it. It's allowing larger stuff to pass through. And so he didn't quite have the confidence to say he discovered something really new. He published it and said, this is curious. And it was only, it was about uh, six years later in Delft, which is where that very attractive blue pottery is made in the Netherlands, um, that uh, another well-known scientist called Martinus Beierink actually repeated the experiments and actually was convinced that he had indeed discovered a new class of infectious agent. Um, and um, he termed this, he didn't know what it was, so he just used the Latin word for poison, which is virus. And but so he that... just dropped it into the publication. He, I've discovered this new entity is a virus. That's it. 
sorry for interrupting, but isn't it somehow surprising that, I mean, health matters of uh, and health issues, uh, sorry, of human beings uh, also would have required a scientific interest prior to investigating on plants or were people's behavior, were they smoking that much that they were worried about uh, this pathogen agent affecting their uh, cigarette <laughs> production? What was the issue? How come that the first uh, ever discovered virus was something affecting nightshade? So if I may say that nightshade is a family of plants, ladies and gentlemen, biology, which I had to learn. I had no idea before that the potato belongs to the nightshades and contains also some nicotine. Mm -hmm. uh, the tomato, uh, mm -hmm. I think the cucumber as well, and strawberries, there are about a few thousand of um, alkaloid nightshades contained. Oh, incredible number of alkaloids in, in plants. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I think the reason was it's, the, in a way, the ease of doing the experiments in that you're handing something which wasn't infectious to the scientist okay. and you can get a lot of it. Um, actually getting enough material from a, a human or an animal sufferer of um, a viral disease can be quite difficult and also a bit dangerous because it could infect you. Um, and, the, the, and the big problem was, that unlike bacteria, um, which had been discovered in 18th 19th century you can't culture them outside so you classically see a picture of a bacterial growth on a petri dish and these you know uh, spots growing or and you can grow bacteria outside the organism the main organism in the case of viruses you can't do that so you're just stuck with what you originally isolate and you can get far more material from a field of tobacco than from infected individuals now i should say viral diseases of humans and animals were um, well known, um, but their cause wasn't. So their um, tomb carvings from ancient Egypt of people with apparently symptoms of polio. Now we don't know they had polio, but it looks like it from the, <clears throat> the depiction. Um, and so people knew smallpox, horrible disease, um, but they didn't know what caused it. Um, uh, and so viral disease, the disease was known. It's just that it, what they, nobody could work on until um, this work in the late 19th century could identify them as an independent, as, as an organism, separate organism, distinct from bacteria. And that's because you can't grow them in pure culture, it makes them difficult to work with. Do we know anything from the history? I have read that um, the disease was called the mosaic disease prior to uh, Ivanovsky's discovery of the virus. Um, is this mosaic uh, t pattern on leaves, which appear like brown shapes, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, so the something which had been pattern. known for centuries before yes. that? Yeah, I mean, yes, the disease, like I was saying, polio, yes, the, the condition was known, the cause wasn't, though, um, and people were get, you know, trying to get an idea. I mean, for a long time, for instance, vile diseases of, of humans were ascribed <clears> to <throat> bad air. It's just something in the air, like a toxin, a heavy metal, um, unknown whether it was an infectious agent. And that was the, the same with plants. Are these caused by too much sunlight, not enough nitrogen? But there's this idea that you could get more you, um, you put in. I should say that around the time of almost identical time to Bayerich's work, um, a couple of uh, scientists working for, I think, the Prussian Academy of Sciences, Löffler and Frosch in Germany, um, also did, did similar experiments on um, foot and mouth disease, which is obviously a, an important disease of animals. And particularly the interest there was horses for cavalry. Um, and it was causing a lot of debilitation um, and concern to the, uh, the military at the time where horses were so important. Um, and so they discovered, again, you could filter the agent and you could infect further an animals in that case not plant. like a like a sort of uh, old-fashioned bioweapon one would say yes and actually there were plans certainly during world war one to try and use such things um it's almost impossible to control and so you'd infect your own side as well as the the opponent um so no there, there was that that thought you could so Part of, uh, because we started our discussion also related to the fascination, uh, this fascinating aspect of uh, the tobacco mosaic virus, I believe that geometry, perfection, crystallization, 
crystal aspects, anorganic aspects of this virus are part of this uh, fascination. And if we look at amyloid, at crystal or crystalline... Um, an article of tobacco mosaic virus. A wow. Model. <laughs> just wow, fascinating. Thanks. Helical, beautiful symmetry. Just thought I'd show that to Oh, the that's great. That's the way how it will look like. Yeah, yeah, it'd be much longer. And so this is a segment of it, but a beautiful helical array. Um, very stable. And this consists of these rods. Yes, quite long rods. Um, and uh, actually, Byring in 1898 was even able to get an estimate of its size by its rate of diffusion through agar. I mean, um, if he, if the paper he wrote was. And I've read it not in Dutch as it was originally written, but in um, English translation. It's fascinating to read, um, you know, how with very limited analytical tools, or those available at the time, what he was able to deduce that this was like a macromolecule, not a whole organism. Yeah, because we you presented this perfect example of geometry. I think talking about amyloids, uh, if you don't mind, and their structure. Yeah. Um, uh, would be a good piece of information also for our audience and for a better understanding of the tobacco mosaic virus. And while mentioning amyloid, we must also mention who first of all discovered the amyloid. It was the German biologist and lawyer Schleiden. Um, at, the, at the beginning of the, um, of the 19th century, he discovered the starch, the starch investigating another nightshade, as I said, the potato, and called it amyloid. Yeah. So this geometry of uh, amyloid fibrils in cells suggests that uh, suggests, as we said before, certain pattern. So um, is actually the tobacco mosaic virus inducing this mosaic pattern? How does it happen? Uh, is it linked to its uh, amyloid um, enhancing uh, geometric form or pattern? How can we easily understand what is inducing this? geometric right. pattern okay um so that, that's interesting i mean a lot of viruses <clears> on plants <throat> um induce these kind of mosaic symptoms and the reason you get this kind of light and dark area um is that because of the the way plant vascular the veins work um the virus doesn't get everywhere at the same time and also, the plant mounts a kind of counter defense. I mean, it's not antibodies, but it has its own type of defense mechanisms. So the virus is able to multiply more in certain parts than in others. And when it really multiplies, it um, uh, actually takes over the metabolism. And that makes uh, often plants, when they get sick for whatever reason, um, they go paler because um, they can't make as much chlorophyll and it breaks down and so virus infections will often give mosaic patterns and i'm just going to reach across and i get a, a different type of virus which i work on a completely different shape it's also symmetrical huh. this okay. is based on icos a icosahedron um cowpea mosaic virus and infects cowpeas which are a different type of host they're legumes um and it's a, a shape like this very very attractive um but um this will also cause mosaic symptoms, even though it has a completely different symmetry to this. And in, and in fact, they can infect the same host. They have an overlapping host range. But these are the two main types of sym symmetrical particles you get from um, virus particles. And this is, is that also a single RNA strand virus? Yeah, it's single stranded RNA. Has It's got a split genome, so it has two different bits of RNA in it and in different particles. This is just one. Um, so these are the two underlying symmetries of viruses. Hmm. Um, this is uh, made by 3D printing. I should have had uh, models from the from the actual three dimensional structures as determined. So you get these two very basic types of symmetry. And I, a lot of biology going all the way from muscle fibers to amyloid plaques to tubules have this helical symmetry. Um, it's a very common motif in biology. And is this helical symmetry necessary for the replication? Yeah, I mean, both these viruses will will replicate fine um, in, in, in their respective hosts. Um, they, they just package their RNA 
um, in, either with like a central cavity in this thing. This, some of these, these are called spherical particles. I mean, they're not really spherical, um, icosahedral particles, and some of them will put them in a helical. And, and it's really interesting because the RNA is sort of in this area here, and it's very well protected by the coat protein. These things are very, very stable. Um, you can leave um, the virus For around. years, I read. And it's very resistant, isn't it? It is highly resistant. You can heat it, you can, um, and I mean, and I think the most remarkable thing is it's particles survive curing of tobacco. Um, so it infects the plants. Um, the plants are harvested, and of course you don't, most tobacco is used still for smoking. There are other uses, but and most of it goes through a curing process. It's dried, hung up, um, and uh, they, it goes brown, as we classically see tobacco, mixed with other things, chopped up, put into either or either loose tobacco or into cigarettes or cigars. And there's an experiment you can do, and undergraduates often do at university, um, is to take some tobacco from a cigarette, say, and grind it up and put it on plants, rub them, and it'll give an infection with the virus. The virus actually survives all that treatment. So the high proportion, uh, the smoke from a cigarette contains particles of uh, the tobacco mosaic virus. It certainly can do, certainly can do. And, and the experiment you do, it's a bit of fun, is just to try brands and see if they have the same amount. Um, but it certainly can do. So if you smoke, you're exposed to a lot of stuff, of course, a lot of um, will contain stuff from the proteins of the plants and all the plant material. But you can get tobacco mosaic virus in the smoke. Yeah, because by burning the the tobacco, it will definitely, I believe, really uh, destroy. Sick. Yeah. Oh, well, you would have thought. I mean, now whether they're infectious anymore in the smoke, or whether they're just bits of yes. residual bits. Do you get uh, pieces or bits? But what happens? Let's take, for instance, old smokers used to uh, 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 make their cigarettes to to yeah. turn them. They were in touch, let's say, with the tobacco, got in touch with the virus, and then they were smoking the tobacco, which by heating was was actually destroying the virus. Yes. Um, might they have received some or produced some antibodies against tobacco mosaic virus? Because we know from uh, several papers regarding Parkinson that uh, there is a connection between a certain uh, autoimmune reaction of smokers and of non-smokers uh, regarding Parkinson. That uh, in uh, Parkinson disease, smokers seem to have a more um, a better outcome than non-smokers. Well, definitely, you can produce antibodies against TMV. Um, in fact. A huge amount of immunology was done on the early days about how the immune system recognizes proteins in this case was done on TMV because you could get a lot of it pure. Um, and of course, I mean, making antibodies to things you inhale is actually quite common. Um, so, for instance, hay fever is an immune reaction to pollen. Now, the pollen's not infecting you in any sense. It's just being recognized as a foreign protein on your mucosal surface and you mount an immune response and you know, it can be more or less severe. And How long happens, would it take to produce antibodies against, let's say, a certain tobacco virus strain? Well, I, now through the lungs, I'm not sure, but normally you can, you can get high antibody response to a lot of things, you know, in a few weeks or a month or two. And you can do that experimentally. Um, I'm sure you produce the first ones very quickly. But then you amplify it, so they're detectable. And given just speculatively that the tobacco mosaic virus might uh, jump across the species barrier, um, and let's say smokers might have antibodies against, let's say, 20 different strains, and all of a sudden they get in touch with a complete new strain of the tobacco mosaic virus, then they will obviously have no antibodies against the new strain. Or could we say that? such antibodies cover most of the strains of mutated tobacco viruses? Well, um, I have to say there's, there's never been any evidence that the virus actually can infect and cause a disease of humans or mammalians. I mean, it can jump to related plants, 
but never, as far as I know, to mammalian cells of any sort, um, or even insect cells, or um, things which are, you know, more closely related to you know, other plant species. So what, what I think you're getting there is just the kind of immune response you'd get if you would, you know, inhale pollen or something you're allergic to. It's that kind of response. These are not, in a sense, protective antibodies. You're not being infected with the, the disease. You're just responding. I mean, you can artificially raise antibodies to anything, and that's the basis of food allergies. Um, people get surface just by contact allergic to um, latex, which is, I mean, very unfortunate if you have to undergo surgery. And there's a lot of um, the equipment, uh, you know, has latex in it, latex gloves. So just raising antibodies or an immune response, you can do that to anything. It doesn't have to be an, a biological thing. So I think what you're getting with the TMV is you're just, you're getting anti because you're inhaling material and your mucosal surfaces are very good at recognizing things of a certain size and raise antibodies. And that's actually the basis of um, modern biology. Yeah, and modern flu vaccines, you'd give them intranasally rather than injecting them. Now I got, got mine by, it's mainly young children who get them intra intranasally. I came across a paper um, called The Invasion of Tobacco Mosaic Virus, RNA induces endoplasmic reticulum stress related to autophagy in HeLa cells. Well, HeLa cells are experimental yes. cells used yes, in so science. Well. Yeah. And uh, this paper has been published 2012 by scientists from the Wuhan Institute. So they were looking uh, of the role which the tobacco invasion might play in invading. Um, it's how it uh, it might affect the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so we're talking about cell uh, organisms which under stress um, start a protein misfolding process, which may then induce severe neurodegenerative disease. So apparently the scientists from Wuhan 11 years ago considered a potential role of the end, uh, uh, um, endothelial endoplasmic reticulum and the tobacco mosaic virus. Do you share their point of view? Do you think, uh, at least from a scientific point of view, that such a scenario could be possible? Oh, yeah, definitely. A lot of plant virus infections within plants induce endoplasmic reticular <clears throat> proliferation. And in that, they're often those, that proliferated um, membranous network is often the site of replication of the virus. So it's possible, and there are examples in, say, individual cell cultures, if you introduce, say, um, an RNA from a completely unrelated virus, it would be able to replicate within an individual cell, which is, of course, not the same as in causing an infection in an organism. Um, and so that, I mean, I, I wouldn't rule that out. I haven't actually seen or looked in detail at that, that piece of work. But, I mean, to me, it, it's interesting. Uh, but I imagine any replicating RNA would probably do it. Um, so I think, you know, so I can imagine if the TMV RNA was able within an individual cell to amplify, um, it might well induce. A lot of things actually induce ER proliferation. I mean, it's a, a common response. It's sort of defense response. Um, so, I, 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 yeah, that, that, that's certainly possible. Yeah. Um... We also have now uh, a debate and lots of research related uh, related to vaccination, to a vaccination mechanism mm. using a vector of the tobacco mosaic virus. So that means that a gene of a, a surface protein of a virus is uh, implemented, or what, I don't know what's the proper term into integrated, this, yeah, would be fine. integrated, let's say, in the um, in uh, the genetic information of the tobacco virus. And then its movement protein will be actually the protein to uh, uh, trigger an immune response. Well, well what they do there, and uh, we've done certainly a lot of work on tobacco mosaic virus, <laughs> I've been using this other virus, it's more, more my, my favorite. <laughs> what, what you actually do is you integrate your gene and um, 
you introduce that into the plant. And so the tobacco mosaic virus and carpi mosaic virus, and a lot of these plant viruses amplify very well. And they're basically, they would like to make lots of their own coat protein to make, to make the particles, but you've, you've removed that. And so they make the surface protein of your target um, virus instead. Now that doesn't assemble with the RNA, it doesn't recognize it. So what you're doing is you're turning your plant into a factory for making the, let's say SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. It's the one in the news a lot, but it doesn't have to be. And then you extract that protein, not, not the TMV, that, that's done its job. It doesn't make any particles. And you purify the protein, formulate it in whatever way, and then administer that. So it's a purified, say SARS-CoV-2 spike protein as the vaccine. Um, it's exactly the sim similar kind of approach to that used if you were to make a vaccine in animal cells. You'd use maybe an, an, an animal virus to do it. I mean, I'm thinking it's not quite the same, um, the Chadox system, because you're actually administering the whole virus to a human in that case. Um, but you're, it's, it's a protein production system. You're not giving the TMV, effects as TMV to the people. Yeah, it's actually giving the the protein of the virus Which made in plants. Yeah. Exactly, but if this might be used for vaccination for health protective mm -hmm. measures, one evil mind could use uh, the tobacco mosaic virus to build proteins of really severe disease. Oh yes, indeed, and uh, so it goes the other of... way around as well. Yeah, so you can you certainly people use the t TMV vectors. Um, I would you know, I use cadmium mosaic virus ones, lots of other ones are available. And because they're so productive in plants, you can use, you can turn your plant into a little sort of bio factory. And so we worked on mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2, we worked on dengue virus, we've worked on, produced in plants, but you, we then extract the, the protein once it's made and then do experimental immunization with it. It's funny that um, the tobacco and the nicotine related aspects do not stop at the vaccination model against Corona. Scientists even from the Pasteur Institute have observed at the beginning of the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic that smokers were somehow more protective, protected against a severe form of COVID than non-smokers. So most of the studies so far is more quantitative. Quantitative. So they look at statistics to how many percentage of smokers we have in society, how many were affected. Few scientists like um, uh, uh, Dr. Luis Stratko from um, a psychiatric clinic in London, and he also accepted my invitation. He wrote a paper back then about the cytokine uh, storm and the protective role of nicotine. Then uh, we, I even read in Germany several articles about uh, the nicotine patches, which uh, were, well, not administered, but people heard about it. It was at least at the level of rumors that uh, while people were using them in order to uh, uh, reduce the symptoms of long COVID. So surprisingly, we have a nicotine, a tobacco connection before we start producing a tobacco, uh, tobacco mosaic uh, virus based vaccine. <laughs> so from all over the places, uh, we have a nicotine and tobacco connection with a respiratory virus. I mean, isn't that strange somehow? Well, it's, it's this remarkable sort of circle. I mean, so nicotine definitely has an effect on you know, lung function. I believe, and I'm not an expert on this side at all, so somebody might correct me, um, that it has a vasodilating effect, which is why people like smoking. Um, and so we have the effect on the brain. Uh, yeah, well, that's absolutely, that's oxygen cool. levels and yeah. all sorts of things like that. So that's, it's very interesting actually about the smokers and, um, and uh, COVID, um, because of course, in the very early days, you know, we're talking now probably three years ago, um, there was this curious observation, or, and I think it's borne out, uh, that uh, there were more men seemed to suffer more than women. There seemed to be a, a um, 
you know, there were more cases of, of severe COVID in men. A higher people. form of justice in the universe. Yeah, it could well be. <laughs> um, and some people speculated, and I don't think this turned out to be true, that it was possibly to do with more men smoke than women. It's, you know, and that it might be enhancing, you know, the disease. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's been borne out. But it's, it's interesting that, and I'm going back to all the adverts, which I, well, they'd sort of gone by the time I was growing up, but a lot of old adverts for smoking used to prom promote the health giving aspects of cigarettes, the stronger, the better. Um, and that was all to do with, I think, this <clears> idea that <throat> it would, you know, <clears throat> help you breathe if you got infections. And that may well be connected with some of the pharmacological properties of nicotine. I mean, I'd certainly all those a lot of those alkaloids have a lot of properties. I mean, caffeine is an obvious alkaloid, makes you more alert. Um, and, and and that's more vasoconstrictor, I believe. But the uh, so that so it's not to me not surprising that nicotine could have some bearing on you know the progression of disease. Um, uh, we may stand a bit uh, with an advertisement. So, um, <laughs> uh, one of the first movies ever dealing with nicotine, it was a silent movie at the beginning of the 20th century called Princess Nicotine. But it dealt with a water nymph from old uh, Germanic mythology. Ladies and gentlemen, this you may Google or find it on YouTube. But now coming back to the role of nicotine, um, Professor Lomonos, if you mentioned uh, its role in uh, lung disease, but also related to Parkinson, uh, epidemiologic studies of Parkinson's disease uh, indicated that uh, the distribution of the disease in various populations have, these studies have uh, uh, consistently found over a number of decades that cigarette smokers have lower rates of Parkinson disease than non-smokers. I mean, we're talking about a uh, brain disease, a neurological disease, <clears throat> and also about a disease cre uh, created by this amyloid plaques. So whatever we do, now in English you say what walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and flies <laughs> like a duck, must be a duck. So in whatever which corner we might look, we might look at um, what uh, radiologists observed at the beginning of the pandemic. They've observed this amyloid fibril lungs and they've described it with a mosaic, um, uh, a mosaic pattern. So we have the mosaic pattern in COVID lungs like in other amyloidosis, uh, amyloid disease uh, of, of, of lungs. We have its role in uh, neurology. So nicotine and the tobacco mosaic virus plays still nowadays an absolute fascinating role beyond what Stanley 1946 have show, uh, uh, could prove that a virus is organic and inorganic. Mm -hmm. Famous. Crystallizable. Crystallize. Yeah, absolutely. Because they're these beautiful um, structures. How, but how was this cube looking like? Um, the, the crystals. Um, yes. There are photographs of them <clears> and they <throat> do look like... Um, yeah, uh, sort of like a, a classic crystal, but they're much softer. There's a lot more water, water in them than, um, say, salt. That's the ones you see most often, or copper sulfate, which are very hard. These have got a lot of water in them, but they do look like crystals. Um, and I've seen crystals of my virus, or my favourite virus, TMV. I've worked with those, and they are. They look like little crystals. You can't really believe there's something, a biological molecule in them. But it enables you to solve structures to be able to crystallize. So it's incredibly useful. Um, is it it's just a simple question? Is the replication mechanism of the tobacco mosaic virus making it such an attractive vector or vehicle uh, in order to inoculate other species with a, with a protein for vaccination purposes, or let's say even for a biological war, uh, hope God it will not happen. Yeah. Is it, it resistance? What character of this virus is making it so special? Well, it's just, and quite why this is, it's still to this day not understood, it's so productive. I mean, when it uh, affects a tobacco plant, um, it just takes over. Um, and most of the protein being made is its coat protein. 
Um, it's the beginning, it's the ability to very efficiently subvert the normal plant functions. And that's really what viruses do. But the, the remarkable thing, although it's doing this, Geminic doesn't kill the plant. And I was always taught that a good parasite, which a virus is, um, does not kill the host because otherwise it dies as well. Um, now, whether viruses are living or, or you know, is, is a debate over the years, um, self-replicating. So it, it, it is quite remarkable and that's what makes it so interesting. Um, as I say, most of the protein in a plant infected with TMV is TMV. Um, and so, and, and it's so stable, so it will last. Um, it's been found in Arctic ice sheets. It's been found in the stratosphere. Um, it's, you know, the particles are so, and so easy to work with because of that stability. So its stability is actually, um, it's, it's main characteristic. Yeah, and, and stability it's Stability against, um, about, against heat, uh, about how many de degrees Celsius are we talking? Well, you can um, certainly up to 60 or 70 degrees, which is um, what's interesting, what's rather fascinating, is that if you really heat it under certain conditions, you know, close to 100 degrees, close to boiling point, you can convert it from this kind of symmetry to something like that. <laughs> it just changes its symmetry. Um, and is and it people, inactivated? Yes, I won't be active at that temperature um, and, and in that form, but it's, it's very odd. It just undergoes this massive structural uh, reorganization. I mean, some people found that very hard to believe at first that it could do this, but it does seem, you know, it's been repeated quite a few times and people have tried to look at mm. possible uses for that. Um, but it looks like the subunits have undergone a, a structural transition. And what do we know about an optimum temperature? Let's say if you had the choice between zero degrees, 20 degrees or 37.6 degrees, which temperature would be the optimum temperature for the virus, for the tobacco mosaic virus? Yeah. Well, if this had pure particles, it wouldn't care. It would be it fine would. at any of them. All the, the danger of 37 or something warm is that unless you're careful with it, very careful with your sterile technique, something else might grow. You know, a bacterium will grow very well at 37. And so if you had just one cell in your preparation, it might be taken over by, wouldn't harm the virus particularly. But you so the temperature is affecting its uh, replication speed? Well, if you're inside a plant cell, yes, it tends to, the optimum, or we'd normally grow a virus like this around 25 degrees. But that's more, you're limited by what the plant likes. Okay. Uh, okay. So if you go to 50 degrees, not many plants will survive, and so you won't get anything. But experimentally, let's say you would uh, expose a plant to 38 degrees, would it be uh, fine. Uh, extend It'll be fine. quicker or? As as you increase the temperature, normally you increase the replication rate. Um, so if you think of tobacco fields, um, they're good, they're in hot climates, okay. so temperature can easily reach 50, 40 degrees. I mean that's standard, yes. and they're certainly happy with that. The main problem is you know, how much water the plants can get. Water plays um, uh, also another major role uh, uh, for the tobacco mosaic virus. What can you tell us about the quality of the water? Um, well, it I mean, seems to love pretty clean water, isn't it? Oh yeah. Well, normally, if you well, if you irrigate a field where it grows, you can um, you would just have ordinary agricultural water from rivers, and and it's what the plant will tolerate. Um, if we want to store the virus. And we don't want anything else to grow in it. We use, you know, obviously highly purified water uh, to make sure there's nothing which, you know, might promote growth. It's mainly about growth of other things, um, and and you want to know exactly what you've what you've got in your composition. And if you're going to, of course, administer it for any um, kind of analysis or any protein made from a plant, you have to be very careful what else is in there because it has to be pharmaceutical grade. But before the disease was discovered, I guess farmers um, also were, were aware or knew a certain technique of hygienic conditions, how to stop the proliferation of the of the virus. To which techniques or strategies, uh, which techniques and strategies did they apply, did they use in order to save, let's say, uncontaminated uh, plants from contaminated plants? It's That's a very interesting question and it, it's quite um, a, also widely applicable to all 
crop species susceptible to, to viruses. I mean, there's no real cure. Um, so what you tend to do, what farmers tend to do is look, look out for um, plants showing symptoms um, and remove those as soon as possible. Well, that's a bit late normally. So there are test kits to look for the presence of the genetic material. I mean, before the virus was discovered, let's say at the beginning of the 19th century. You'd look for signs of mosaic disease. Okay. And you'd remove those plants and burn them. Oh, you burn them? Oh, or, or, or just, yeah, that burning would be the normal way. Get rid of those. Um, but what also people did know about um, is you can get resistant varieties of tobacco and you can do breeding programs. Oh. And there's a famous resistant gene called the N gene, capital N, um, which is in most commercial varieties now. And that makes the plants largely resistant to um, the virus. And so you can get these resistant lines um, and basically you don't have to worry anymore. And people do that with all sorts of um, uh, crop species to get you know, resistance to resistance, yeah. diseases. Mm. You breed yeah. it in. Um, of course, it's a continual arms race because the virus or indeed the bacterium, because you do the same for that, will also evolve and then try and have a counter so it's, it's a constant battle and a constant looking for resistance genes. Now, towards the end of our discussion, another very fascinating aspect um, was referred to by Dr. Gajdusik. He received his Nobel Prize for uh, Medicine 1976. And while doing his, his uh, research and the investigation of Kuru, a very seldom neurodegenerative disease about which he did not believe that it was related to cannibalism, he thought that Kuru might be, he even wrote a paper called A Fantasy of a Virus from the Inorganic World. And in that uh, article, he compares the slow virus to the tobacco mosaic virus which might be the similarities if we take uh, scrapia and we take the tobacco mosaic virus what may what might make them similar and where might be the differences okay when well, so it was absolutely fascinating because i remember reading about you know good work when i was actually uh, an undergraduate so wow so it's a long time ago <laughs> um and um so the fascination there was how long the incubation period of the disease was. Okay. It was years, um, but it did seem to run in families. Um, that was the that was uh, a major thing. Um, whereas things like tobacco mosaic virus, if you were to rub it on a plant, you see the disease within a week. Um, that's very quick. quick. Um, so there's this massive difference, and so that caused a lot of puzzlement. The other thing is that. Um, the, if the infectious agent, which was subsequently I think, called prions, um, we uh, do not appear to contain any genetic, genetic material in the normal sense. Of course, huge confusion, and Gajusic himself could not detect any nucleic acid. Um, and that, you know, made people stop and think, can these really be infectious? Um, the current thinking is that the presence of a sort of seed of an, an aberrant protein makes, if it's administered to an individual, whether it's a human or a cow or a sheep, like scrapie, somehow causes the endogenous proteins within the animal to flip conformation. And um, that's, uh, uh, and, but that's and there's something completely new. So they are quite distinct. I mean, tobacco mosaic virus is almost like a classic virus. Well, it is the classic virus. Um, and uh, whereas these very slow agents which don't appear to contain nucleic acid, um, I seem a very different organism. That said, you know, the structure of things like amyloid filaments does have this helical similarity to particles on TMV, but helices are a very common symmetrical structure. In, in viruses. Biology. Yeah, in viruses, tubules, muscle fibres. It's just a very classic symmetry where you make everything in the same environment. So there is that 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 commonality and I represented uh, similarities but also differences um, surprisingly Gaidusik passed away 2008 and um, I think it was his last article Kuru's contribution in medicine which he published with um, the Royal Society uh, publishing then he suspected the amylodologists who are the 
amyloidogists. It sounds like a profession, like right. a group of people spreading amyloid disease. I mean, I can't even pronounce this amyloidogists. <laughs> no, <it's>, uh, <laughs> For approximately 35 years, if I may quote, I have been aware of the work of amyloidologists in their attempts to accelerate the appearance of amyloid deposits. Yes. Wow. Yeah. As if it was a profession or a certain group of, of people, apparently, uh, proliferating such amyloid disease. But why only in animals? I mean, if they proliferated and do the spread to animals, it, uh, to vertebrates, it may even work for human beings either. So that's very funny. I mean, that was his uh, last article. And... Um, he compared, he had quite a philosophical approach. He yes. compared the slow virus and this transmissible amyloid disease with the computer program and the computer virus. And he said, look, mathematicians, they created a software and there's nothing physically moving from their desk to the computer. <laughs> yes, it's electronic. It's electronic. But you send an information which will actually start um, this nucleation process. Yes. Inducing uh, the amyloid fibrils. And that's, I think, so difficult to understand, even for, for, for some uh, experts. It yeah, it is. it is. And there have been, over the years, many arguments about how this can be, um, what is actually um, happening um, in human. Um, one of the problems, of course, about studying this work, um, these kind of entities, is A, the length of time. You know, they're very slow to develop, but also you can really only diagnose them after death. Um, you can think that something's happening, you know, people experience the symptoms that might be, but the, the diagnosis has really only been after the person has actually died. Um, and fortunately, I mean, they're not that common, but it's, um, it, it's, uh, it has made you know, the study very problematic. And of course, the safety issues as well. I mean, people. Yeah, I mean, amyloid fibrils um, uh, are again an issue in the context of COVID. Uh, this pattern, uh, uh, experts encounter it in the brain, in eyes, in lungs, in the cardiovascular system. So we don't have just to deal with nicotine. Um, we also deal with uh, are dealing in the context of COVID with um, and Corona, which is, by the way or used to be a Cuban cigar, we had dealing yeah, with... Also a beer from Mexico. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> if that is maybe containing the, the yeast. Also interesting in the context of prions, <laughs> that's a different question. But yeast and tobacco are two of the, uh, I would say, as a non-expert in this area, two of the, the plants or, or elements from biology, biology having a strong connection with this type of new neurodegenerative disease. Yeah, I mean, so the lot of things, I mean, of course, neurodegenerative disease can be caused by um, many things, including just impact. I mean, all the, the studies of people in the National Football League in the US, there's a lot of similarities to these lesions. And that's not a something being transmitted. It's a, 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 some kind, of, I think the technical term would be an insult to the brain, to the neurological, which is just an impact. <clears throat> and it's somehow trying to repair itself. It's a reaction. So that's another way of looking at it. I think um, your perspective as a scientist, um, I think needs a lot of vision and creativity in order to deal with uh, plant pathogen agents and find a use, an application of what you have observed and investigated for the benefit of also of plants and of human beings. And I think this is a, a very, very important contribution which you have. Well, thank you very much. I very, very much enjoyed our conversation. Thank you very much as well. Mr. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. George Lomonosov, professor for virology, an expert in the area of the tobacco mosaic virus, was our today's guest. George, thank you very much for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.